thought that this was just going to be another random weekend of a Marvel release where we're going to look back at the golden days and complain about the mid storytelling and saturation of these films and how slowly and steadily we are falling out of love with the way the movies are getting churned out. The third installment of the Guardians of the Galaxy franchise directed by James Gunn came this weekend as a send-off for the misfits that he brought to the mainstream and left such a lasting impression. One considers the characters of this universe as the quirky geeks of the classroom, each having distinct personalities and who can get ostracized for being their unique selves. They were never the jocks or the nerds, but somewhat in between, and we resonated with the same personality traits as never did one envision before the first film dropped that the array of characters in this universe will become so beloved for all of us. Going in with zero expectations as James Gunn joins the new rendition of the DC universe after this, I cannot tell you how pleasantly surprised I was of the journey that this installment took me on. There is actually not a greater feeling as a movie buff when a film just delivers on all the right notes, especially when recent history has only disappointed you. The third installment focuses on the Guardians having to face a new threat in the form of the high evolutionary. How his obsession with creating the perfect specimens and universe has a direct correlation to Rocket and his origin story culminating into the mission they embark upon through their intergalactic space travel forms the basic storyline of this film. I've tried to keep it as vague as possible because this film truly needs to be explored in the cinema hall versus me giving away key plot details. So getting into it, here's me telling you the good and bad aspects of the film so that you guys can ultimately decide whether to watch Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 in theatres or not. I think I'm going to do a pretty good job in convincing you that this isn't just some generic Marvel film. So let's get into it. The Underwhelming Aspects Length and Portrayal of Adam Warlock The film is 2 hours and 30 minutes long and I do understand that this is almost on the conservative side when it comes to the length of films that we are used to in the current timeline of superhero movies but I definitely think that some of the fluff being scrapped could have definitely made the edit crisper. While one would argue that they would have actually liked an even longer film as it marks the last leg of the journey with our most beloved characters so they wanted to stay a little longer in the theatre and just see them banter with one another, I felt like some of the gags definitely prolonged the running time. Whether it be Nebula and Mantis being constantly argumentative with each other or Star-Lord's obsession with reminding Gamora of the good memories they shared or hell, Drax and his obsession with lying down on a couch. I understand the purpose of these sequences being just an indication of their unique relationships, all conflict just being a projection of how much they care for one another, but one does wait for them to get to the point of the mission. But I guess that's what makes this franchise so special, right? That they bicker and whine and pull each other's leg while the stakes are at an all-time high? Did I just argue with myself against a point that I made? Maybe. Okay, moving on, coming to the biggest point of contention and that being Adam Warlock played by Will Poulter. I was actually so stoked for this casting because Will as an actor is someone who I've followed since he was a child artist. But Adam Warlock for especially diehard superhero fans and avid readers of the comics was a dream come true. A perfect cosmic being called him finally on the big screen. But the screenplay of the film does not really do justice to the magnetic presence of the hero. He comes in and out at random intervals and the character is offered throwaway jokes and gags that reduce him to be a caricature, spoiled and somewhat dim-witted young adult. There is some respite to how the character is utilized in the final act and I acknowledge that the creators are thinking of the character long term, but it seemed like a convenient Uno trump card in the end versus what could have been an exceptional supporting role throughout the film. The Good Wacky Production Design and Costumes I know many people including me have been critical of the CGI dependent backgrounds of the Marvel Universe that seem to take the shape of desktop wallpapers at one point of time but I really have to say purely from a visual standpoint Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is so immersive. I saw this on IMAX and my god was the production design, the character choices and the choice of colours as the crew embark on this journey was as if Willy Wonka had a marriage with Star Wars. Infused with such distinct colour schemes and imaginative sets, it was as if Spy Kids 3 3D had modern technology. The movie really does look like an acid trip and I mean this as the biggest compliment and I realize this has a lot to do with the conviction of James Gunn who can make us interested in even a starfish being a worthy antagonist. These crazy ideas that don't seem to be choices made on a whim but as if one has taken a plunge on an absurdist painting and finally gets what the artist was going for versus standing at an art exhibit pretending to get what any of this means. What a fun soundtrack and set pieces. For anyone who has absolutely fallen in love with this franchise, you would know how essential the soundtrack of the film is and boy oh boy does it deliver in this film. The acoustic version of Creep by Radiohead perfectly setting the tone of where we left off. 
You've got rainbows since you've been gone perfectly placed for the origin story of Rocket. Reasons by Earth, Wind and Fire, the perfect conclusion with Florence and the Machine and the dog days are over. But my favourite has to be the integration of No Sleep till Brooklyn in the seamless action set piece that is designed as a one-shot special as the entire crew annihilates the creatures around them. I have to say that some of the set pieces really stand out. Two really come to my mind, one that involves Groot and his ability to holster ammunition and how he teams up with Star-Lord and one in involving Kraglin as he taps into his belief. The technical prowess of this film is undeniable, but what's an icing on the cake is that the writing delivers too. Who would have thought? The group of misfits and the lack of forced humour. I have to again reiterate why we fell in love with these characters. There is such a perfect union in the chaos that they possess and each character has the ability to shine in several moments. Chris Pratt as Star-Lord is his charming best. His dry humour and persistence in making people believe he can convince even corporate shills on the other side of their pure motives is absolute gold. Even in the moments of earnestness, Pratt delivers so well, especially in his cry of agony as he sees someone slipping right in front of him, making me think, what a perfect casting he truly was a Star Lord. Zoe Saldana as Gamora really is the feisty new version that keeps us on our toes. Her memories with the crew have been wiped away and she is far more guarded and on edge than the Gamora that we knew. This actually allows for a great dynamic and for her to get well versed with their distinct personalities. Her annoyance with Peter and the sudden outbursts of rage are hilarious to witness. Drax and Mantis really are such a cute pair in this film. The acknowledgement of one's intellectual incompetence and Mantis's empathy and love for the crew generates some heartfelt moments, and this especially works as Nebula's tough exterior is put into question. Nebula's laser-focused approach to the mission puts her at risk several times, but it is in the lighter moments where one really feels for her, understanding why she has put several walls up in order to protect herself. Groot and the inventive ways James Gunn utilizes his powers in action scenes, especially a moment where Star-Lord jumps off of a building was such a cool creative call. The best part about this film is that unlike recent Marvel films, the jokes, no matter how stupid in the grand scheme of things, actually deliver. An argument on Zognuts, Drax not being happy with the colour of the costumes because they don't match his eye colour or his inability to understand analogies. Peter's acknowledgement of Nebula's beautiful dark eyes, all of it is immaterial but is essentially what makes this crew special. But if you ask me personally, the cherry of this film was that it was emotionally immersive and it all has to do with Rocket and his origin story connected to High Evolutionary. Rocket is the soul. I'm going to say this and it may sound absolutely bonkers to all of you, but I found Chuck Woody as the high evolutionary far more compelling, scary and interesting than most recent villains in the MCU. There was a madness and delusion that he brought to his never-ending quest for creating perfection, and it genuinely scares you to the lengths he is willing to go to, especially as it ties into Rocket's origin story that absolutely broke me. The special effects and animation team have done such a fine job in extracting a humanity in those eyes of Rocket that it really, after a long time, made me emotional in a Marvel film. It's not only that, but Bradley Cooper's dialogue delivery that makes it even more special. I would want you to experience this yourself in the theatre and understand why Rocket really develops into becoming the soul and anchor of this film, contributing to Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3 not only becoming entertaining, wacky and fun, but emotionally engaging. Of the slate of Marvel films that have come out after No Way Home, this definitely stands out as the best for me. And that was the video guys. Write down in the comments below what you thought about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Please don't forget to follow me on Instagram, the handle is right in front of you, follow me at JammyFans4. Also please support us by smashing the like button and subscribing to our channel for weekly content ahead. Thank you for watching.